hands it to me, but he doesn't put it on me and he doesn't set it. He doesn't do any of those things he should do. <laughs> well, good morning uh, and a delight to have you here on this 13th Sunday of Pentecost. And uh, we'll, oh, a couple of announcements that I just want to make sure that uh, we tend to, you know, looking ahead, Rally Sunday and the Fall Festival, and I think that's been up on the boards too, that's, uh, that's coming up September 10th, but the day before that, on Saturday the 9th, we're going to clean ditches. What, what is more fun than that? So I think uh, I th the light behind you, I think that's Kim, is that Kim standing there, the lights, oh, there you are, sure. So, you know, if you've got some time on that Saturday and uh, want to help out with that, I think you can get a hold of her and, uh, and uh, we'll uh, find something for you to pick up, uh, that's for sure. Uh, don't have anything else in particular uh, to say other than we're uh, up to two weeks in the parsonage now and, uh, you know, just gradually settling in and uh, really just, just loving it. Such a peaceful place and, and such a beautiful uh, place for us to be living now. We're just very, very happy and very, very grateful. Well, let us then, without further ado, sing our opening hymn. Won't you please stand? My hope is built on nothing less. Number 294 in the Green Book.
Well, let us compose our hearts and minds then for our order of confession. And we begin in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so now, in a moment of silence, give unto God what burdens your heart this morning. And we pray, Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. And so now, as a member with you in the priesthood of all believers, but by the authority of Jesus Christ our Lord, I therefore declare to to you the entire forgiveness of all our sins in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray together the prayer of the day. Care for your church, O Lord, with perpetual mercy, since we totter and are sure to fall without your grace. Remove what will harm us and arrange what will make us whole. Grant this, we pray, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. We'll have our lessons. The first reading is from Isaiah chapter 51. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham your father and to Sarah who bore you, for he was but one when I called him, that I might bless him and multiply him. For the Lord comforts Zion. He comforts all her waste places and makes her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the voice of song. Give attention to me, my people, and give ear to me, my nation. For a law will go out from me, and I will set my justice for a light to the peoples. My righteousness draws near, my salvation has gone out, and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands hope for me, and for my arm they wait. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look at the earth beneath. For the heavens vanish like smoke, the earth will wear out like a garment, and they who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will never be dismayed. The word of the Lord. Now we'll read Psalm 138 responsively. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. For you have glorified your name and your word above all things. All the kings of the earth will praise you, O Lord, when they have heard the words of your mouth. They will sing the ways of the Lord, that praise the glory of the Lord. Though the Lord be high, he cares for the lowly. He perceives the haughty from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you keep me safe. 
The Lord will make good his purpose for me. O Lord, your love endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. The word of the Lord. The second reading is from Romans chapter 11. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. The word of the Lord. Will you all please rise for reading of our Holy Gospel. This morning we read from the Holy Gospel of Matthew from the 16th chapter. When Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ, the gospel of the Lord. Won't you be seated? Grace and peace to you from God, our Heavenly Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. To him be glory forever. Amen. To the Lord God, our Father, be glory forever. Amen. In his letter to the Romans, the Apostle Paul sounds the theme of our readings for today, this 13th Sunday of Pentecost, God and glory forever. But what exactly is this notion of glory to God? Is it a thing we can give or render unto God. Remember, Paul also said, or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid, what can we give to God that isn't already his? Okay. So, is the glory of God already his? And we just chant about it. We sing about it. We look at it. Isaiah tells in his prophecy of the word God had given him to proclaim to Israel. Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look at the earth beneath. For the heavens vanish like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment and they who dwell in it will die in like manner. 
but my salvation will be forever and my righteousness will never be dismayed. The things of the earth and all those who dwell in them, that is, those who worship the things of the earth, wealth and possessions, politics and culture, fashion, cuisine, social status or social righteousness, all such things and all such people who put these things first shall wear out, shall come to an end. But the Lord's righteousness and salvation will endure to the glory of God forever and ever. So maybe it is a thing already unto God. You know, when I think about glory, I think maybe we conceive of it as something seen or something to be experienced, witnessed. We think of the glory of God as bright, dazzling light shining forth, the sound of many trumpets blasting a fanfare, flowers being cast from all directions, and the swelling sound of cheering and praise from great hordes of adoring worshipers. Glory is a happening. It's an event, a thing to be in, be experienced, and even swept up into. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord, as the great battle hymn of the Republic declares. Today we read Psalm 138 together, and you chanted, I will bow down toward your holy temple and praise your name because of your love and faithfulness. And then also, when I called, you answered me. You increased my strength within me. Good and fine things to say. And they speak of a glory for God or to God or of God. But the glory of these words is not in the reciting of them, but in believing. Believing these words in your heart. Bowing and praising his name because of his love and faithfulness is glorifying unto God when you know the love of God in you and believe with your heart that it is steadfast, that it is always there no matter what comes to you in this life. And our psalm then responded to that with a faith statement, when I called, you answered me. God is glorified because you have believed and trusted, not merely because you bowed, so does a captive before a tyrant. Nor because you parroted some words written by some guy who's been dead for 2,500 years. Paul picks up the theme in his proclamation. One of Paul's more famous lines is from this epistle reading today. So we, though many, are one body in Christ. And having gifts that differ according to the grace God has given us. Paul begins with such a beautiful statement of God's providence. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are His judgments and how inscrutable His ways! For who has known the mind of God? Who has been His counselor? Or who has given a gift to Him that He might be repaid for from him and through him and to him are all things to him be glory forever amen but Paul does not leave it at that he lays this out as reason but then describes how the glory of God comes to be in making his appeal to us present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God. Do not be conformed to this world. That is, 
Don't give yourselves over to love of those earthly things that Isaiah tells us will wear out like a garment. Now, does this mean you can't enjoy the fruits of your labor? No, of course not, for God has given them to you. But in faithfulness to God, don't let them become your idol. Be transformed, Paul urges, to seek to discern and then delight in God's will and walk in his ways as we pray. See not greatness in yourself as measured by earthly standards, but regard yourself according to the measure of faith God has provided through the Holy Spirit in you. Don't scorn or grumble about what God has given others, but thank him for what he has given you, because what he gives to each of us is in turn needed by all of us. Someone needs to be the butcher and someone the baker and someone else the candlestick maker. And so having gifts that differ according to God's grace, we give glory to God by using them to do his will. Not because we think we must, but because we love. Remember, I just said, even the captive bows to a tyrant, but he bows in fear, not honor. Bows to force, not of loving obedience. He hopes to avoid suffering, not show adoration. It is for our part how we respond using our different gifts, but acting out of common love. And so Paul urges, if you can serve others, then serve. If you can teach, teach. If you can motivate others or lead, then do it with energy and sincerity. If compassion is in your heart, or joy, or merriment, then share it with love and respectfulness. If you can give, then do it generously and cheerfully. God does not want the pageantry, the flowers and the fanfare, the cheering and the speech-making. Just as he did not want the offerings burned at the altar, once they became acts of prideful display of the wealth of the giver before the community, or merely the bowings to the prescribed duties under the law, rather than the offer of loving faithfulness. God wants you. He wants your heart. He wants you to love him back and to love all the other children of this world that he has made. That is his will. And doing his will out of delight, that is to God's glory. And that is what we see in this gospel lesson from Matthew today. A reading that sounds to us really quite simple now, 2,000 years later in a world where Christianity has been so long established where Christians like us go to our churches on Sunday mornings and we sing hymns and we repeat prayers from hymnals in long distribution. We make our prayers together and we know because we have learned by long practice to say, hear our prayer right after we hear, Lord, in your mercy. Yes, we hear Jesus ask, who do you say that I am? And we hear Peter reply, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. What's the big deal? Everybody here could have answered that question in more or less the same words. But Paul wasn't a Christian. Didn't go to church on Sunday mornings. Didn't follow along in a bound hymnal. He left his life and livelihood to follow a man whose person and presence compelled him that powerfully. And as he lived with this man and heard his teaching, he was moved in heart and mind to belief. And so when Jesus asked him, who do you say that I am? 
Our Lord was not speaking the opening line of some pre-printed litany that provided Peter a response. No, he asked him a straight-up question. And Peter responded from his heart. And see how Jesus responded to that, confirming for us that Peter's words were true witness, not parroting. Peter knew in that moment what the Lord God had put into his heart. Peter had given glory to the Son of Man in declaring him the Son of the living God. Now, if Matthew were writing his gospel today, he might have written that when Peter answered Jesus saying, You are the Christ, that Jesus maybe grabbed him and hugged him with great energy and joy and love and then maybe said to him, Simon, son of Jonah, you nailed it. You rock. In fact, I'm going to start calling you Rocky. And on this rock, I'm going to build my church. Well, uh, as it happens, that really is more or less what Matthew did right. It just doesn't translate into the English that well. You see, in Greek, the name Peter is Petros, and the word rock is Petra. So Jesus was using a little word play here. Oh, he sure was. He said, you are Petros, and on this Petra, I will build my church. And for some of you deeper readers out there, it works out the same way with the name Cephas, the name that we read for Simon Peter uh, from Paul's writings and also in the, uh, the Gospel of John, and which is in the Aramaic language, which was undoubtedly the language that Jesus and his apostles used in common daily conversation. And in Aramaic, though, Cephas also means a rock or a stone. But in any case, Jesus is speaking his plan in which Peter will figure greatly, but not the man alone, the rock of the church of our Lord and Savior is faith. Faith that God sent his son to deliver for you at a cross because he so loves you. Loves you. Because you are his glory forever. Thanks be to God. Amen. And so may the peace that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's sing our uh, hymn of the day, Faith of Our Fathers, number 500 in the Green Book.
Well, won't you stand with me now, and we will recite together the words of the Apostles' Creed. I want to take a moment while I'm strolling on out here. Uh, once again, the screen's new and everything, and we are working on uh, readability and uh, you know, clarity so that uh, they can be the useful tool that we ordered and put them up to, to, to be. And so we need to hear from you. You're not going to put anybody's nose out of joint. You're not going to offend anybody if you give us your commentary on what you can see or what you think might m help make it better. That's the input we need. So you can talk to Sheldon. Uh, you can talk to me. You can talk to Chris. Uh, any of us, if you have some input. Because, again, I'll repeat, we bought these tools for you. So they need to work for you. Don't be afraid to let us hear from you. And now let God hear from us as we declare together, proclaim the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Let's share with one another a sign of that peace. Good morning. God's peace. begin our offering.
Lord, we thank you for the many gifts you have given us. Teach us to use them in charity and compassion, in stewardship and service to others. Through your Holy Spirit, give us awareness of your mercies, that with truly thankful hearts we may praise you on our lips and in our lives, that we may give ourselves to your service, that we may walk in your ways, holy and by the righteousness of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us compose our hearts now for the prayers of our church. Loving Lord, help us to take up our cross and follow Christ, turning away from the ways of the world in order to put Jesus first in our lives. Conform our lives to his and continue to form us for service in your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. God of light, grant your grace and mercy to all students and teachers, administrators and aides who are all returning to school in these days. Ensure that each classroom would be a place of learning and growth. Bless all those who teach and all those who learn that your knowledge would enlighten their lives. Lord, in your mercy. God of all glory, grant that those who hold offices of authority would govern with equity and honesty, serving the needs of their constituents and acting fairly amongst all peoples. Let their hearts be attuned to your Holy Spirit as you work in their lives to accomplish your will. Lord, in your mercy. God of healing and wholeness, grant new life to those who are in pain, that are suffering, and that their suffering would end, and that they would be rejuvenated. Give your peace to those who are distraught or dejected, and those who confront other health concerns, that all might have the strength to face the day, trusting in your mercy and, and healing power. And today we remember especially Dee Dee and Ricky and Kurt, Tom, Ken, Roger, Stephen and Alan, and those in care centers like Zelda and Marianne, Ruth and Warren and Mabel. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now let us pray the words that our Savior taught us. We pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our closing hymn, The King of Love My Shepherd Is, number 456 in the green.
Go in peace and serve the living Lord. Thanks be to God.